name's Vivian Choi. I'm a trade lawyer at uh, Covington and Burling in DC, and I'll moderate the panel today. Um, I wanted to kind of set the agenda before I ask our speakers to introduce themselves. So the program description in our book says you should join our panel to discuss the future of free trade. And the program description also lists a bunch of measures um, that are implicated in the future of free trade, like ABCDD, um, SHIPS Act, trade controls, 230, 231 tariffs, et cetera. So we'll plan to give you a very high level overview of each of those measures. You know, assuming not everybody here is a trade lawyer. And then I'm going to invite the speakers to give their views on what those measures like mean for the future of free trade. So by nature, this panel is going to be very um, opinion heavy. It's going to be uh, contemplating the future of free trade where, you know, we're still not sure what's happening. Uh, the ideas are still forming and not fully baked. Uh, we should also make sure to inform everyone that all the opinions expressed here are of each of our personal views, not to be attributed to the law firms we're at or our clients. Uh, so hopefully this is a safe, small group. <laughs> to freely discuss uh, what's on our minds these days as we kind of step back from the day-to-day -day trade work that we do and think about what, what this means for what's ahead of us. So can I get each person to introduce themselves? I thought maybe Eugen can start. So Eugen is um, a kindly agreed to join our panel because the speaker who was planning to come couldn't make it. So she's not in the program though, so I'll have her, I'll have her start. Great, thanks, Vivian. Um, my name is Eugene McNamara. I'm a trade attorney at AD Gump Strauss Tower and Feld uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, I was added to um, this program yesterday around 8 p.m. <laughs> so I apologize if I'm not fully prepared for, for a lot of very delicate and intricate topics that we're going to be talking about today. Um, my focus um, in my practice area is uh, import controls um, and hit dumping and countervailing duty measures, uh, primarily as well as representing sovereigns and, and um, advising governments as well as companies on um, international trade rules such as WTO disputes and WTO rules. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Chris Tamura. I'm in the Washington, D.C. office of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher. Um, we have a very broad multidisciplinary practice in international trade. Uh, I'm a specialist in export controls and sanctions, but uh, at, at Gibson Dunham, I practice across the disciplines. So, CFPS uh, 232, 301, some of the things that we're we'll talking about today, uh, it's all a part of, of what we're asked to do and part of our clients. But uh, thank you all for making the time this afternoon. We look forward to a good discussion. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Beck, uh, Beck Sanu. Uh, I'm here uh, representing Chipyong, which I consider Korea's most progressive law firm. Um, previous to joining Chipyong in January, I was in house uh, at several companies, Hong uh, Tire, the STX Group, and SEA. Um, and in those capacities, I built out, designed and built out the legal compliance and trade functions. So uh, I'll be talking a lot about the in house uh, uh, capacity building and the need to do so uh, in connection with the uh, trade. Great. Um, and again, I'm Vivian. I'm, I'm based in D.C. at Covington. I do trade law. Uh, I mostly do ABCBD trade remedies investigations uh, at the International Trade Commission, but also working in U.S. kind of trade policy and lots of things that we're going to talk about today. But as you can see, you know, among our panel, we have W2 experts, trade remedies experts, trade controls experts. We have the in-house perspective, the, the U.S. perspective, Korea perspective. So, uh, lots of different opinions to be discussed. Um, and I wanted to sit here with our speakers because it is like more of a discussion, but I'm told that to click the slides, I need to be over there. And I do think people like looking at the slides sometimes. So, I'll, I'll go over there. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to do that? Uh, would you? Yeah. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Thank you. We should show them, yes. Thank you so much. No problem. Great, okay, okay. All right, so we're gonna get right into it. So when we talk about trade, uh, a lot of us think about the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Um, 
So what's happening there? So I'll give the I'll give the kind of high level overview, and you didn't have to see me slide that maybe. <laughs> but you don't have to worry. So I'll do the I'll do the high level overview of what we're going to talk about, and then the speakers will opine on what this means for free trade. So you know the World Trade Organization. It was first an agreement that was made in 1948. It became an organization in 1995. 2001, you had the Doha negotiations and China joined the WTO. It was like a very exciting time where it seemed like non-market economies were going to agree to WTO rules and like play play into the same playbook of trade. Uh, and then things were moving along. 2019, uh, President Trump blocked the appointment of an appellate body member uh, of appellate body members of the WTO. Uh, and that basically kind of stops the functioning of the dispute settlement system at the WTO. Um, and the, the concern was that the appellate body members that were adjudicating these disputes, they were interpreting WTO agreements in ways that WTO members didn't really sign up for, and it was, uh, it was diminishing US rights as a result. So because of that, we don't have a functioning appellate body anymore. Um, 2020, you know, some other countries are trying to find other ways to keep dispute settlement alive at the WTO through, through arbitration arrangements. And the U.S. has still, they are still committed to the WTO, is what they said, but on new terms. Um, so the discussions of kind of reform of the WTO and reform of the WTO dispute settlement is ongoing. So the question to this panel is, how, how do you view the WTO these days? And we're going to start with Eugene, who is our who is our expert on WTO issues. Thank you, Ravina. Thank you for this. This is actually um, I'm actually almost glad that I haven't seen these because it, it does kind of like bring up a couple of other issues that that um, I hadn't really thought about in this context. But I mean, first of all, I think that everybody recognizes that the WTO is at a weakened state right now. Um, that's no secret. And and I think that you know there have been some concerns about is the WTO dead. Um, is, are we just moving away from a multilateral system? My view is that the WTO still remains relevant and that it still is very important because it's the only thing of its kind that we have. I mean, it might be outdated. Um, there might be some issues, um, to be clear, but it represents an agreement that 160 plus companies have agreed that these are the common set of principles and these are the common set of rules that we can agree to abide by. And I think that that itself, I mean, and it, there really isn't a comparable type of thing where the entire world has come together to say, hey, look, I agree to, to abide by these very specific trade rules. So even if, you know, the dispute settlement um, body itself is under, you know, crisis, to be quite frank right now, I don't think that that means that the WTO itself as a whole um, has, has, no longer has a role. I think that it's well recognized that the WTO agreements are outdated. Um, they're from 1995, and there really haven't been significant developments in the agreements since then, and I think that that is a problem. And we're seeing that as we're seeing the economy change, and we're seeing the world change with, you know, with e-commerce and with environmental factors becoming more important. You know, the divide between goods and services is becoming more and more blurred as the economies um, evolve. Um, and, and that is a problem, but I think that that's a recognized problem that the members are working through. Even if the dispute settlement body isn't functioning, there are still vibrant discussions at the WTO, you know, in the context of, you know, e-commerce and digital trade, um, and in, you know, trade and environmental sustainability discussions. Um, I also think, you know, one of the things that um, is interesting here is that, you know, the U.S. Was, is a superpower. It was basically, as a member, strong enough to kind of derail the entire dispute settlement process. But at the end of the day, the WTO is designed as a member-driven, as a, as a, as a you know, member-functioning organization in which the U.S. has the same number of votes as any small, the smallest company, or the smallest member um, country. And so we're, what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of other countries step up and taking up the leadership role and kind of filling in the void that the U.S. has kind of left by leaving a lot of the WTO behind. And I think that the MPIA is an example of that. We're also seeing, you know, outside of the WTO, the multi or the plurilateral agreements that are going on, the regional agreements that are going on, um, whether it's RCEP, whether it's CPTPP. And those don't directly rely on the WTO, but I do believe that the WTO provides a really good starting point to have those multilateral discussions. So at the, at the end of the day, yes, the WTO is weakened, but I still think that it is a very important and relevant organization. 
Thanks, Eugene. That's, that's really helpful. You are truly the WTO expert. Well, Chris, I know you don't do WTO work, but you've given thought to the issue, especially given your focus on kind of the ESG aspect. Uh, what are your thoughts on the WTO EPA? Yeah, I, I concur with, with uh, Eugene. It's clearly that we can say um, it was a very bit of a different time when I was finishing, when I was starting law school in 19. 99, I think, was my first year of law school. And it was heady days for the WTO, and all of us international lawyers wanted to study WTO law. It was the most exciting thing out there, and we thought that was the future of our practices. Um, but I think what's interesting is, is really how current events have kind of put pressure on the different WTO agreements and the base assumptions underneath them. Um, so, for example, the, the, you know, the, the COVID epidemic, I think, revealed in a completely new way to people. Uh, what the compromises are and setting the trade-offs when you actually um, set up an international system on the role economic principles and um, uh, comparative advantage. Uh, so uh, the inability to obtain you know, critical goods within the United States or within Europe and having to rely on China for those, I think really brought home the idea of there, there needing to be um, you know, basic industrial capacity in, in the more developed countries um, and still uh, to be able to manage those sorts of issues. It's also the case that some of the basic assumptions of the agreements, I think, are coming to light in a new way. So, for example, you know, WTO agreements are built in the GATT agreements, and at the time the GATT agreements began, it was really, um, it was really at the time when the ILO was actually a prominent player in, in international law, and during and they kind of delegated issues like forced labor actually to the, to the ILO. And so, uh, the WTO agreements, none of the agreements, never really talked about the idea of combating forced labor or factoring in. What, 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 what kind of competition forced labor actually introduces into the market. And so um, I think particularly with evolving market expectations uh, within ESG, I think it shows a lot, it basically hopefully identifies a way in which new agreements can be forged to kind of address those issues, but it also clearly shows some of the gaps now. Chris, and we'll circle back to forced labor later, later in the panel. Michael, you're our in-house, on the ground perspective. What's your take on the WTO? Okay. Um, I think it's interesting from from a Korean perspective, especially uh, for Korean manufacturers. You know, the, the rules have changed quite a bit. They become much, much more complicated. Uh, it used to be uh, the case that you know the WTO, uh, for better or for worse, it, it was the the kind of default system in which we all operated. And although the Korean government until recently hasn't been very proactive in in, in voicing. Uh, position, it's been more reactive and passive uh, until recent days. Um, but it was relatively clear. So ADCB, you know, safeguards, uh, we, we dealt with them from the NS perspective, most of the accountants. And uh, uh, it, it was you know, part of part of the, uh, the the regime in which we needed to operate if we wanted to export. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Trump came in and the world became very, very complicated. Not only because of, of his initiative, but you know, it, it, I think, as as, uh, as Chris pointed out, we can't do worse this from you know, the, the backdrop of this hegemonic tension between the U.S., China, and to certain extent the EU. So that that underlies all of this current stuff and ESG as well, in my opinion. Um, and and so you know it is what it is. And for smaller countries and for companies within those smaller countries that are trying to to export globally. Um, we need to adjust to these rules, but you know what's clear is there's a lot more uncertainty, and a lot more uncertainty means more risk, and more risk means that it's more expensive. It also means a lot more good work for trade lawyers, um, and, uh, and a lot of advice that, that is, is needed. Uh, but it, I think, from the in-house perspective, the last thing I'd like to say is it requires uh, capacity building uh, in order to to react to this rather than uh, and manage it for, you know actively as opposed to simply working with the accountants once a year and uh, checking it. Um, this is a much different environment. Yeah, I think there was another trade panel yesterday where the, the consensus was that all these changes are going to be good for, for lawyers who, you know, we have to pivot a little bit, right? We have to adjust to the new new system as well, but uh, we, clients need us, need us so that, that's, that's good. Uh, all right, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So we've been throwing around the term ABCBD a lot. Uh, ABCBD is their anti-dumping and countervailing duties, and they're called trade remedies because these duties are intended to 
address unfair trade practices by providing relief to domestic industries injured by imports sold at less than fair value. That's, that's called dumping. Or the imports are subsidized by a foreign government. That's, that's a, because of a subsidy, uh, you can uh, impose countervailing duties to kind of offset the impact of the subsidy. Um, so some people argue that ABCBD duties have have a pro-free trade component. Uh, these duties can act as a pressure release valve that helps governments commit to an overall free trade, uh, trade liberalization, uh, march for free trade by increasing public support for, for liberalization measures. Uh, but some people say it's actually not really for free trade because it, essentially ABCBD laws are written to favor the domestic producers uh, and they are increasingly seeking tariff protection at the expense of consumers who are paying the, the higher prices. Can we go to the next slide, please? And, you know, maybe one argument is that the ABCBD as a pressure release valve, it doesn't really work if there's more and more ABCBD orders in place. And this is, this is what's happening in the U.S. Uh, the number of ABCBD orders have been increasing in the last decade. Uh, in 2020, Two, I have a more recent number. There were 662 ADCBD orders in effect. So these are ADCBD duties on imports into the United States. Uh, that's you know double from 2015. And as you can see on the other chart, it is mostly mostly on imports from China. So that that'll be a continued theme during the panel as well. So. Back to, our, back to our speakers on what this means for free trade. Um, do you see ADCP duties as a necessary part of free trade, or is it more of a uh, protectionist measure? And this time, I'm going to start with Michael. Did you have to deal with ADCP duties during you know, your, your in-house position? Yeah, uh, mostly at the steel company. Um, we had uh, ADCP issues uh, in the US. And uh, again, we worked mostly with the accountants on this. Uh, this is pre-Trump. Um, what's come up though is uh, recently much more emphasis on, on circumvention and uh, in connection with ABCBD, but uh, because of the China connection, you know, evidencing that your materials haven't originated you know, elsewhere. Um, and so that, that proving of what you know, the supply chain facts um, is, is quite burdensome because, for example, for the steel company, initially, a lot of the root, the origin of paperwork was done manually. So the first step is to you know, set up an automated system to do the, the origin check, the rules of origin. And then on top of it, you have you know, the other compliance measures. And that will come into play with, with CBAM and, and you know, carbon border adjustments and so on. But that basic infrastructure is, is what we didn't have. Because you know, we also the stuff to for the most part. And then this stuff now is, is coming in-house into the production site. Um, and into paperwork that we need to generate uh, as evidence. So, um, yeah, I, I think that it's less of a concern today, at, at least for the companies that I've been at. Um, it's kind of moved on to more sophisticated and more complicated measures. Um, but that, you know, the, 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 the potential for ADC would be as far as compliance uh, requirements related there to you know, still exist. It's just less of a focus. So interesting that ABC is less of an issue because there's just so many new, new, more complicated measures. Uh, you did. You also have a lot of experience with ABCBD investigations in the United States. Um, can you talk about your view? Yeah, no, and, and that's really interesting what you said, Michael. Um, just in terms of the company's focus on ABCBD, I mean, I think that you know, it's it's a really interesting area to, to go to Vivian's original question of is this a necessary part of free trade? I mean, I think you can have philosophical debates about that, whether a company should be allowed for itself to determine whether it wants to you know, sell something at a, at a lower than cost or at a dump price, or whether a, whether a government should be able to subsidize you know, certain industries. But I mean, that, that philosophical question aside, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's baked into the system. The, co the countries have agreed to have an ABCD system and to allow that system, um, but they put in place certain rules that the countries have to abide by in implementing these ABCDs. Measures. Um, I do think that you know a couple of things. You know, to Michael's point, I think that you know the ABCD environment is changing. We're seeing evolutions, and I do think that um, at least from a U.S. perspective, which is really the only jurisdiction that, that I'm really equipped to talk about, I do think that we are seeing a little bit of a stretching of the rules um, to put more mutually a little bit of a changing of the goalposts or a little bit of a changing of the focus. 
um, and you know, as, as Michael said, you know, circumvention. Um, we're actually seeing recently a slight decline in the number of ABCD petitions that are being filed. We're seeing a greater increase in the circumvention increase. There's a lot of discussion about why that's the case. Circumvention inquiries are, you know, cheaper for the domestic industry to bring. Um, you don't have to show the injury component, which is a big component of what you have to show in a full ABCBD investigation. Um, and it has pretty much the same effect as an anti as an ABCBD investigation in that it can be countrywide. So I think that we're seeing a little bit of a change in the focus, but I think that more broadly, we are seeing more of a politicization of ABCVD. You know, in the past, it used to be you can work with an accountant, answer the questions, commerce has a standard set of questions, you put in the calculations, you answer the questions. But more and more, the discussion that we're having with our, our trade remedy clients really is, okay, we can answer the questions. There's a lot of people that can do that. There's a lot of companies that can do that. There's a lot of law firms that can do that. But the thing is now, more and more, what you have to understand is the political drivers that are driving these decisions. And it does fall into the larger hegemony of the US versus you know, China, to some degree the EU, and, and this global order, where now it's not just a calculation issue, it's not just a math problem. It, you do have to understand kind of where the government is going and what their focus is on in these investigations. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, Chris, I know ADC is not your wheelhouse, but do you have anything to add? Yeah. Two observations. One, I just speaking on Michael's Michael's point before, I think it's just and, and think about this for the panel later this afternoon with respect to supply chains. I mean, ABCVD is just one of the courses that's converging on supply chain traceability. You've got ESG factors that are playing an issue. Uh, you've got um, uh, you also have forced labor issues that are kind of coming in and like being able to prove that something came from a certain place and not another place. So I think it's kind of interesting to see all those converging on that one particular probably a weak point in most companies' compliance systems. Uh, being able to record where things came from and being able to view uh, in two or three tiers down in their supply chains. But just quick, you know, quickly on this point, uh, I think I think they're necessary as a pressure release valve. The WTO uh, dis dispute process and appellate process, if they ever get back up and running, uh, they take years to go through. Uh, and it's not necessarily the case that the national government will decide to bring a case at the WTO on behalf of different domestic producers. By the time a WTO case makes its way through, two, three years later, uh, the domestic industry that's harmed by dumping uh, may be out of business. Like those individual companies might be, might be have no other recourse at that point. So, uh, but I do think, uh, as, as Eugene points out, it does demonstrate the power of the U.S. legal system. Uh, and I wonder if if every country had as robust ADCBD, whether it be such a big issue. But it's the case that the U.S. has a very well developed system, a very potent system, and so. Uh, and that's, I think, what makes it a bit more unfair in the hands of many companies and countries around the world. One more, yeah, one more issue that, that, just one more issue that I wanted to touch upon, because we talked about ESG, we talked about kind of the other issues that are also pressuring companies and how that interacts with ABCVD. Um, I do think the one thing that is worth exploring at this, the, this time um, of, of trade and the current landscape is kind of the relationship between CBD about subsidization and broader public policy actions. And I think that what we're seeing a lot of times is kind of an inconsistency even within a government about what its positions are on certain policy matters. And I think that one big example that we see are environmental programs, where you know I think the world has come together to recognize that each country has to do its part to put in place measures to help the environment, to put in you know climate change um, action. And so you have the United States, for example, you know, at the WTO and at International for us saying, hey guys, we all need to put in really strong environmental measures and we need to help our businesses to be able to work in an environmentally friendly way. On the other hand, you know, so come, when countries do that and put in place environmental measures, a lot of times those are considered countervailable subsidies to the CBD investigation. And then so basically by imposing CBD duties on those same programs that the United States has said that you know countries need to implement, in some ways you're, you're almost penalizing countries for doing exactly what you agree that they need to be doing. Um, I, I'm thinking of the US just because that's the, that's the jurisdiction that, that I'm familiar with, but I do think that you know maybe it's time for a come to Jesus discussion about whether we think that all subsidies are actually bad. Yeah. Follow up on that, since we're in Korea, I mean there's been a lot of kind of wink wink in the, the energy subsidies. A lot of energy um, that is consumed by the industry that is definitely cheaper than, than I'm paying at home. Um, and that's intertwined with this discussion of renewables. 
of it's already cheaper than we have in renewable subsidies. And then finally, we've defined nuclear in this country as being green. So you know, it, it's all going to start converging. And if uh, CBD comes back, I think it'll be because of energy. I agree with that. And I think it's fair to take on the U.S. The U.S. is doing a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. <laughs> so. This is the U.S. It's about U.S. law. There we go. Right. Yes. Right. yes. Uh, can we do the next slide, please? All right. So I think maybe it was Michael who's mentioned kind of pre-Trump a few times now. Now we're now we're in Trump era, post-Trump. So Section 232 and 301 tariffs are um, kind of special tariffs that the Trump administration uh, imposed, and they're, they're still around. The Section 301 tariffs are on imports from China, and it was uh, imposed to combat China's practices promoting tech transfers, and I think that from U.S. companies that the U.S. government found to be unreasonable or discriminatory, that burden or restrict U.S. commerce. So the 301 tariffs on Chinese imports happen, and we also have Section 232 tariffs on imports into the United States of steel, the 25% tariff, and aluminum, the 10% tariff, after the U.S. government decided that such imports threatened to impair U.S. national security. So these all um, came into effect around 2018. And yes, there are uh, product exclusions that companies can apply for. There's some country exemptions from the 232 tariffs. There, there's been litigation both in U.S. courts and at the WTO challenging uh, these measures, but they're still in place. I think some people thought that the Biden administration might do something different, but so far, so far we still have them. Um, I know that the USTR is doing a four-year review of the 301 tariffs and we're supposed to uh, see those results soon, and there might be a different mix of which products get the 301 tariffs, but I don't think it's it's really going away anywhere. Um, so I wanted to get the speaker's reaction to these tariffs. Like, what did you guys think when it first came out, and how do you see them now? And for this one, I'm going to go to Chris first, because Chris Chris works on like the intersection of national security and trade. So I know I know this could be a topic for you to kick us off. Yeah, and it's um, and also being part of the global law firm, we have the privilege of you know working with U.S. domestic clients and multinational clients, all of, and all of them bring different perspectives to the table. But uh, you know, during during the Trump time period, when 232 and 301, I had the privilege of working on several different 232 questionnaire processes and also 301. Um, and and one of the things that was interesting to me is that you know they are kind of the simple of what it means to have aggressive domestic laws actually also supporting free trade and enforcing free trade agenda. But because they're framed around national security, um, they're incredibly hard to challenge. Uh, U.S. domestic courts are very, uh, will not touch uh, national security issues when the arguments are made uh, by and large. And so uh, when a individual country makes an aggressive claim to national security, uh, that makes it all the more hard, I think, for international um, uh, companies to be able to continue to do business uh, with the United States, uh, but you know there are, but there's a range, right? The national security issues are not um, not completely made up. So on the one hand, uh, I worked with a major automotive uh, company on the 232 questionnaire process, and I think it became clear among all the automotive uh, sector participants that this is very much a fishing in, uh, information exercise. It was very politically motivated, very interested in the, the electoral politics of the, of the United States, particularly the Midwest. And that's one of the main drivers behind the 232 process. But I also worked on the uranium 232 uh, inquiry. And it, I was immediately evident how uranium supplies are, are, are super relevant for national security purposes, um, both for, uh, both for um, defense and also for nuclear energy. Now. So those are, that's, a, I think, a juxtaposition of where 232 uh, isn't always in use just for electoral purposes. Um, I think I'll stop there. Yeah, I was going to go to Michael because Michael has uh, experience at a Korean steel company. I'm sure you had to deal with 232 tariffs. Um, what are your thoughts? You don't look happy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think. There's a whole, so much drama in this. Um, Personally, this is when trade got dropped into legal and compliance. So it used to be a separate team of task force in the steel company, and then uh, it became so complicated that you know it, it came into to what we call risk management, and we managed it together. And ultimately, that I think is the right way to go because of the compliance intersections. Um, but 232, 301, you know, has, has 
a little digging will show it's, it's, it was driven primarily by U.S. steel folks, you know, Light Eyes and all, former steel executives, and you know, without respect to personal issues, um, I, I think the, the the national security argument um, is is hard to to try, right? So, um, and it is what it is. It, it, if a country claims that this is you know, essential to their national security, uh, smaller countries, companies within smaller countries, there's a, a very limited amount that we can do to to push this. Uh, the Korean government succeeded in getting a, a quota. I'm not sure that we really ended up helping us. I don't think that was done with a lot of of discussion beyond uh, the one large Korean steel company that it benefited. Um, so you know, each country then, in its reaction, uh, needs to think about whether this is a broad-based uh, support for for the industry in their country or you know, more more micro-focused. Um, in this case, it tended to. Uh, you know, help one particular company, maybe to the detriment of the others. Um, but that's our problem, right? That's our problem on our side. Um, the rules changed, we needed to adjust. Uh, what adjustments were made, um, and as you know, the, the importer is the one who files all this stuff. So, you know, your customers, you have a hard enough time uh, obtaining customers, working with them, giving them additional burdens is not very helpful. So most uh, Korean companies that had to deal with this ended up setting up their own importers. Um, and, and doing it kind of, kind of integrating down the, 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 the value chain. Um, and you know, we dealt with it in that way. Um, ultimately, did this harm uh, exports? Yes, temporarily, but I think it picked up because ultimately the demand is there. Uh, the US uh, industry did not step up to fill all of it. Um, there was a higher price paid, uh, so there's a wealth transfer, you know, all the microeconomic stuff. Um, but adjustments were made. Were made. Uh, I think the take home for, for policymakers and uh, companies today, um, you know, not looking back and, and thinking about the drama that was the steel industry and Trump and 232, but looking forward, uh, what's next is AI, right? So national security, AI, restrictions on technology, that's really significant. Um, that's going to have you know, real impact on all of us going forward. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to I'm expecting, I'm not looking forward to it, I'm expecting that the US would be using uh, these arguments much more vigorously uh, in, in connection with AI chips, a technology we in there too. Uh, and that's something for countries like Korea that have a heavy chip focus, have a heavy technology focus, we need to be aware of and, and probably deal with better than we did uh, the last time uh, with steel. I think that's, that's very crushing. And we'll, you know, we'll talk about Tech and national security during this panel a little bit too, but I'm sure you could have a whole whole session on just that topic. Um, Eugene, do you have anything to add on 232 or 301? Yeah, I mean, I'll just you know, I, I think it's been well covered, and, and I think that you know the discussions have been had. I think that just the, the thing worth worth um, thinking about is is the original issue of what is national security, um, and and it's it's a big question right now, right? From the U.S. perspective, you know, we get to define what our national security is. It can encompass economic. You know, well-being and economic security. You know, other countries have different um, views. Traditionally, it was kind of viewed more as a national defense. I think that there are definitely the easier topics, right? Like AI, like semiconductors, and like uranium. I agree that there are ones where you know it, it smells like national security, and, and you can tell that it's national security. There isn't much controversy about it. But then you have the issues like steel, where the U.S. has made an argument that it is national security. It's also made the argument at the WTO that we don't need to justify ourselves as to why we consider it national security. But I think that as national security starts emerging as such a big policy driver, um, it, I think that it, it is important for us to sit down and think about how broadly we want to define that and how much you know discretion and authority we want to give each individual company um, without any type of discipline to say, you know what, I consider this to be national security. Because I mean, it's not just the U.S., right? I mean, there's you know, there's probably countries that the U.S. would not want to have the discretion of of them defining for themselves what constitutes their own national security as well. You know, just as much as the U.S. can raise their hand and says, "I need to define my national security," so can all the other countries that the U.S. might not want to have that authority. So I think that it is worth at this time just a discussion um, broadly, you know, among politicians, among you know, governments about. What, what we consider to be a proper definition of national security. Perfect segue to the next topic. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So, you know, kind of pre, pre Trump, when I thought about national security, I thought about export controls, trade controls, and sanctions. 
not not tariffs. Uh, so, for example, it makes sense. You know, there's some military items that you want to uh, control from being exported to countries that uh, you're concerned about, or the U.S. will impose you know, economic sanctions on countries or groups or individuals. There's you know travel bans, asset freezes. These are all done in the name of national security uh, to to advance you know a country's foreign policy goals such as counterterrorism, um, promotion of democracy, etc. But uh, as, as Eugene was kind of suggesting, these measures are also really evolving and expanding in recent years. And I thought Chris, Chris is our trade controls expert on this panel. Maybe you can uh, tell us some more about that. I think I'll highlight a couple of different trends that are saying. I think it's helpful to kind of particularly put them in context of this panel as a whole. But um, I think the first is that, um, particularly in the United States, is using new types of export controls to achieve a, a, a range of new objectives. So. For the last several years, the U.S. Uh, has been making aggressive use of restricted party lists, uh, and, and that's one way in which, short of completely cutting off a foreign uh, company's access to international markets through sanctions, they can actually cut off the flow of technology to them or commodities to them, at least that have an access to the United States. So things like the entity list are being used in the, by the Department of Commerce in new and different ways. Um, but more recently, the U.S. is sort of unearthing old rules and using them in new ways. So one of the classic saws of like export controls that almost nobody knew and understand uh, understood how to use is the foreign direct product rule. And now uh, I think we've gone from one, I think to I think there's now 13 permutations of the foreign direct product rule under the export administration regulations. It's one of the most esoteric areas of export controls, one of the hardest to manage, one of the hardest for companies to understand and apply. But uh, it's using this to uh, originally, it was used to uh, amp up and help target um, Huawei and actually cut off their access to uh, not just direct products in the United States, but uh, uh, products that were produced with U.S. technology and software. And now that the government has seen them work in different ways, uh, they've now actually expanded them and opened them up in other areas. I think another um, uh, major trend is that uh, the U.S. is learning to apply sanctions in new ways. So these are the classic economic sanctions. I think it was it was relatively less impact on the rest of the world when the U.S. would apply sanctions to Cuba or to Iran. Uh, but uh, over the last decade, we've seen the U.S. apply sanctions to Venezuela and now Russia, the largest one of the largest economies the United States has ever targeted for sanctions. And as it's done that, I think it's learned to use all of its different regulatory tools, things like frequently asked questions, things like general licenses, things like. Um, um, interpretations that they're otherwise putting out during public public uh, speaking events uh, to actually calibrate how those sanctions are being applied. So I think the United States is being more sophisticated, and um, I know this was kind of a loaded term about ten years ago, but smarter, smarter in the way that it's applying sanctions. But I think that I think the most remarkable development, and one that I think lays the foundation for what we're going to see for the next 15 to 20 years, is the incredible success that the U.S. has had in recruiting and maintaining a coalition of like-minded uh, countries with respect to export controls and sanctions. And uh, here, there's no better example of that than with respect to Russia. Um, and the United States had to figure out with Europe, because Europe was the primary trading partner with Russia, not the United States, how to, how to control even low-level technology goods and commodities uh, from flowing into Russia. And they did figure out a way to do it. Um, and and uh, now, just thinking about that's, that's, if you think about what was done there, that, that coalition, that's, that's a bureaucratic infrastructure. And now that the people in Treasury know who to call a contact in Finland or in uh, uh, the Danish government to talk about sanctions on Russia, uh, you, you can fully expect them to be able to also call them and talk to them about how to apply more pressure on other common strategic objectives like China uh, and other kinds of threats that are emerging, uh, perceived threats that are being, uh, uh, being managed this way. So I think those are kind of the three primary uh, developments, I assume, in most of my practices. Thank you. You are the true expert on trade controls and on this panel. Uh, but Michael, you've also seen, you've also had to deal with trade controls uh, from your compliance and risk management work. Uh, how, how are you seeing that? So, you know, on the ground, uh, working with the restricted party list, the entity list, um, and actually putting that kind of uh, know your customer uh, process in place, and being aggressive about it. So. The issue is that you know marketing, global marketing, sales, they, they want to get these deals done. And uh, there, there's, um, 
there's a sense that, you know, as long as it's technically correct, you know, what is it uh, to you? Uh, we ended up having to wield a pretty heavy club. Uh, one or two of our actual CEOs in the group had U.S. passports. So as U.S. citizens, they're particularly uh, sensitive uh, to, to these sanctions in a personal capacity, you know, and so, um, you know, those types of explanations um, and, and the potential ramifications that extend beyond a particular subsidiary. So you, you can actually end up impacting other companies in your group. Um, so, you know, explaining that these decisions are really beyond your pay grade and frankly beyond the entity uh, that you are at. You cannot decide for the group um, to, to, to wink wink um, at some of these, these, uh, these uh, kind of pain in the ass rules. Um, but at the same time, you know, what we, I think we should also mention is um, the U.S. Yes, as you pointed out, they're getting really smart, smarter sanction. We need to get smarter about um, working within that world, and we need to start you know, at the company level and at the country level, and have uh, sophisticated uh, analyses and, and consideration of this new environment at the national level and then also at the corporate level. Finally, just a brief note: it's not only on the sales side, right? It, there's the CFIUS and, and all of these technology transfer issues and. I didn't really think that this was going to come up for a you know, very conservative manufacturing company, but you know, a lot of companies have their, their venture arm, they have uh, investments, um, and these reviews did come up quite a bit. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't uh, the case that this stuff really came up a lot uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, like, within the venture capital world before. This wasn't really an issue um, uh, at, at that time, but today I think it's much more matter of course um, to, to look at, uh, is this you know, going to require review? Do we need to prepare for this? Um, so on the investment side as well, which is uh, important because that will impact the next generation of industry. I'll just say a quick add on. I talked about the coalition that the United States is doing with Europe and Korea and Japan and, and other countries uh, with respect to, to Russia. Uh, but we, as, 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 as outside counsel, one of the things that we're doing more and more is actually helping compliance professionals within companies Coalition build within their companies because the range of folk, the, the range of targets now for U.S. Act sanctions and export controls is expanded beyond just national security to advance different foreign policy interests, human rights interests, and compliance professionals. Particularly if you're mainly staff, you don't necessarily have the resources to make the argument to your business people who just want to make that last sale alone uh, that they shouldn't be making that sale. And so we're leveraging, and ESG has been a, 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 real, a real helpful tool in this way. But we're leveraging, uh, you know, government relations teams within companies, and we're leveraging um, uh, the, the logistics people to actually come in and help us think through these kinds of issues together. And that, to, in order to be able to help explain, okay, well, we have a human rights concern now, actually, with respect to selling this product, not just a national security concern. And, and in and using that multidisciplinary team, and actually help the compliance teams make stronger arguments with their own company. Very interesting, thank you. Eugene, I know we're not in your wheelhouse anymore, but do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't really have anything to add substantively. You know, it is just really interesting um, the, the points that, that Chris and Michael made. And I think that it does highlight, you know, you know trade isn't a silo anymore. Um, I, I practice, you know, import compliance and import restrictions. I don't do export control and sanctions. But you know, in the past, if I'm in a room with export controls and you know sanctions experts, it was kind of like I had my lane, they had their lane, and we would kind of have like different policy drivers that were that were um, uh, motivating our discussions. And I think that that was kind of the way with companies as well, where each of these issues are kind of viewed separately. You know, as you know, we, we have these types of discussions with people that uh, practice and that focus on different areas. I think that you know we're definitely seeing a, a convergence and a coherence of the policy drivers of each of these actions. And so I, I completely agree. I think that you know it's it's something that that um, is happening that needs to happen within companies as well. Whereas these compliance issues are viewed as a vacuum as individual ABCD compliance, export compliance, ESG compliance. But really, you know, I think that it, it really benefits the companies to have a holistic view of what compliance as a whole looks like. Sorry, but great point. Uh, all right, we're going to continue the theme of national security. And we're going to come back to the earlier question of technology as a national security concern. So CHIPS Act uh, has gotten a lot of attention in Korea. It's, it impacts a lot of Korean companies. Um, it was signed uh, last August. 
and the CHIPS Act uh, was, is designed to promote semiconductor research and manufacturing in the United States by giving out a lot of money of government funds to qualified companies who promise to build facilities in the U.S. And the, there are some conditions for getting the government money. There are guardrail provisions that constrain the companies that receive these incentives from undertaking certain business activities in uh, countries of China. And this is really, I think, uh, a big... Um, yeah, so this is a big push by the U.S. government to kind of bring back uh, manufacturing, especially uh, the advanced technology that they view as essential to, to national security. So, you know, we were kind of circling around the question of how is tech a national security issue? Are we seeing this like definition of national security expanding? And what, what else can we expect to see next? And Michael has already talked a little bit about it. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Chris first since he's our national security expert for your thoughts on on chips. Yeah. Okay. So I think that. So I think uh, you know chips is viewed commonly in the press as being you know a hyper uh, protectionist measure or very um, um, chauvinist uh, kind of uh, way of thinking about things, but. In some ways, you know, the, the long-term objective of CHIPS is to reverse a certain trend that happened within the semiconductor industry, which is to keep research and design in the United States to offshore um, all stages of production outside of the United States. And so over the longer term, the idea of CHIPS is to subsidize and recreate essentially the domestic market for these. And, and while people can be skeptical, I do think that, uh, you know, as we were watching this unfold, and you know, had watched it unfold over some real time, it, was, it really was events like COVID, oddly enough, that kind of demonstrated the, the limitations of global uh, supply chains, actually. And so the possible, the, the, the very clear disruptions that happened there made it clear uh, protected the policymakers in the United States that, gosh, the same disruptions could occur if something were to happen in Taiwan uh, or in Korea, or if, if all of a sudden somebody decided to cut off supplies of critical minerals to be able to support our production. So, so all of these things came together, I think, uh, to kind of promote this. But um, you can think of this as being tampering with the free market, but in some ways, uh, in the US has been the latter. Uh, you know, the, the economies of Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, they all greatly, greatly benefit from government subsidization and, and investment in the semiconductor industry in each of these countries. So for the United States to come forward and say, you know what, we're not, not comfortable with the effects of the complete free market in this case. We need to turn around and subsidize that and bring some of that back to our, our own shores. Um, so I think, I think immediately the idea was, let's bring it all back here and make it over the United States. I think as implementation has come into place with chips, I think there's been a more, uh, more sophisticated and nuanced understanding of what it would actually mean to do that and kind of more of a recognition that certain international supply chains need to be maintained. So, I think those are some of the problems I've seen. I know, I know you did kind of have things to say about subsidies, but I'm going to go to Michael first. I don't know if you're aware of or touched, you know, the semiconductor space, but but what's your take on where the U.S. is going with things like Chips Act? Just very briefly between the Chips Act, the PS, and then actually the the, the Senate hearings on AI, obviously I spoke uh, very eloquently. Um, a lot of these closed door meetings, uh, I, I think, that are occurring are not necessarily all about regulating AI, but it's, it's related to the uh, national security issues. Um, so there are a lot of open Senate hearings uh, for public consumption, but there are also meetings where, where this national security implication um, is being discussed uh, quite thoroughly. Um, this is huge. It's, you know, Korea, Taiwan, we benefited, us, you know, clearly benefited from the old way of doing business. We need to adjust uh, to whatever hours that we will decide we can do. Back to you, Eugene. You get to say a few words. I just, you know, what I, what I love about this panel is that it's just very thought-provoking for me. I hope you all are enjoying it as much as as, as I am, and, and as I hope we are. Um, but you know, like we've, we've kind of like you know, prepared kind of remarks, but as I listen to my colleagues, just you know. Um, I keep thinking about kind of different perspectives and, and different things, and I think that you know, to, to, it, there's a lot of philosophical questions for me here. 
um, in terms of you know these issues about national security, about subsidization, about you know industrial policy, about you know picking champions within the industry. Um, and you know I take Chris's point about you know well we're, we're so dependent on the manufacturing of, of important technology in, in foreign countries, and doesn't it behoove the U.S. to bring that back into the U.S. and and you know shouldn't we um, basically what's wrong with with uh, supporting U.S. industries to be able to do that research? Um, you know, and, and it kind of goes back to kind of that, that, that point that I was, I was raising about subsidies, you know, do we think subsidies are bad? I, mean, you know, it, I, I think that that's kind of also a philosophical question as well, because I, mean, I think it's true that if you, if you do adopt the, uh, the, um, the, the global trade rules that, you know, like you shouldn't be subsidizing in order to give yourself an advantage, then yes, I think that this is an uber protectionist measure. But then it goes to the philosophical question of, well, you know, you don't want to be so purely reliant on, on uh, foreign manufacturing. But then that, you know, if you take one further step back, that kind of becomes a philosophical question of was globalization of that thing. You know, so I think that there's just so many layers to this. And, and um, so rather than any practical thoughts I have on this, I think that these are all, you know, uh, unfortunately things, you know, that we can talk about here kind of um, as and as, as um, theoretically, but we do need to kind of put in place mechanisms and, and, and a proper understanding of, of what the rules are surrounding these issues. Um, so, you know, the, the, the one thing that I'll just say is that, um, you know, I do think that there is, you know, a gray area. There's, there's national security and there's some competition issues, right? Where just one country simply is more competitive than the other or is better than the other at doing something. And I think that, you know, there's sometimes clear national security issues, there are clear kind of competition issues. I think the semiconductors is definitely one where we're in that gray area. So if anybody wants to debate Eugene on whether globalization is a good or bad thing, you can ask her for a phrase later. Um, okay, so let's see, so we went through chips. Now we're going to environment. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So in addition to national security, environment is another big topic that's being tied to trade measures. So the EU has proposed a carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, called CBAM that would impose a tariff on certain imports based on the estimated tons of greenhouse gas emissions associated with the import. Um, the objective would be to promote equal conditions of competition between producers in the EU that are subject to very strict, stricter emissions uh, reduction policies than producers in other countries and encourage those other countries to adopt comparable policies so that they're not uh, getting these, these uh, border adjustments for their imports. So I was wondering, is this an example of how trade can be a race to the top? Because um, when we kind of study trade, there was also this notion that trade can be a race to the bottom where you just go into like Southeast Asia and there's sweatshops, like that was, that was a rhetoric uh, in the past, but if we link trade and environment together in this way, is this a race to the top, or is this, again, just protectionism? And Eugene, I was hoping that you would kick us off for this one. Wow. Um, well, I, you know, to your direct question of is this a race to the top or is it protectionism, I don't think it's an either or necessarily. I mean, it could be a race to the top that has a, a protectionist effect that has a discriminatory effect. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that this is where I put another plug in for the WTO, that it's not that it's still important, it's still relevant. Um, because, you know, the WTO agreements, you know, they're actually designed to weed out the discriminatory effects and to, you know, and, and disguise restrictions on international trade on measures that seem to be racially origin neutral. Um, and so I think that those rules are applicable here, where yes, we need to put in place environmental measures. Yes, the CBAM is intended to equalize between the EU you know, emissions trading scheme domestically and, and, and the imports that are coming in. Um, but there's also that risk of it being applied in a manner that is discriminatory and that it does serve protectionist purposes. And sometimes whether the EU intended for it to or not. And I think that the WTO rules provide a good guideline to kind of see if, if your measures are in fact, you know, uh, doing what they're intended to do. 
Um, and I know that the EU has made several statements that made it very clear that they have designed both the ETS and CBAM in a way that is supposed to be WTO consistent. So I think that that also shows that, that countries still consider the WTO to be important and those rules to continue to be relevant. Now, whether the EU has successfully done that in every aspect, I think, remains to be seen as we see the implementation. Um, but I think that the WTO, it does provide the best framework to determine whether your measures are being used in the way that they're Thank you, Eugene. You've spoken like a true devotee of the WTO system. Uh, Michael, how do these environmental measures come into play in your compliance and risk management work? Well, I, I love this, this regime. Right? It's, a, it's very smart. Uh, what it does is it, it pressures of other governments to get their act together. We've uh, been slow, a lot of lip service um, in, in countries like Korea in, in, in getting this carbon order. The, the, the emission trading going. Um, this this forces us to do it because it's elegant, right? If, if we don't do it, the Europeans are going to collect our taxes, tariffs, and customs. That's what it comes down to. So the government policymakers realize that, well, if we don't want our companies to pay these monies to the EU, and we'd rather collect it for our coffers, we need to get moving. And, and so uh, I, I just love it as an intellectual. Um, measure it's just elegant. Um, what it is though for companies, it's ESG. Right? So uh, ESG not not only for disclosure and sure, you know, financial transparency on, on, on environmental impact and TCFP, you know, all that's great. But this actually has a bite. If you want to sell into the EU, we need to get our act together on on these emissions and similarly for supply chain and labor issues, uh, which I think will hit next. Um, I, I think it's an elegant way of doing things. I think it's probably the future. Um, you know, in the context of the WTO or otherwise, um, a little bit passive aggressive. So it reminds me of, you know, I started working in New York, it's very aggressive aggressive. We moved to California, everybody seems really friendly, but it's actually kind of passive aggressive. <laughs> this is uh, a, a passive aggressive approach, and it works. <laughs> that is so interesting. Um, it's a positive way of seeing it. That's great. Chris, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would say. This, this is definitely not something that we house, but I, I, just taking a big step back and thinking about a philosophical um, position, if you're a free market enthusiast, you should be kind of excited about this, right? Because it's always been a problem to try to factor in the cost of carbon, the true cost of carbon on communities and the natural systems uh, into, uh, into the products that we consume. So CBAM is really a pretty interesting mechanism, actually, to make sure that the people who are consuming goods pay the costs associated with the true cost of energy consumption and the type of energy that they're using to produce the goods. So I think, I think it's a very novel thing. I think it's very clever and very excited to see where it goes. Great. Uh, next slide, please. So as promised, we're also going to touch a little bit on how labor comes into play with trade measures. So now trade measures are being used to achieve foreign policy objectives such as promoting human rights. And one uh, kind of marquee program has been the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, the UFLPA in the United States that came into effect last summer. Uh, the U.S. is now banning imports made by forced labor in the Xinjiang uh, autonomous region, Uyghur autonomous region. And the EU has uh, proposed kind of analogous regulations. So it seems like when it comes to forced labor, it should be less controversial that this is, you know, that this is something that it's okay to do. It's it's not so much about protectionism. I would love to hear your thoughts. Maybe maybe Chris, I know this area is a large focus of your practice. Yeah, increasingly, uh, you know, supply chain issues, that supply chain traceability thing we were talking about before. Uh, but there are several different pressures converging on. But there's nothing quite like having your goods detained at the U.S. border and, and massive massive value, massive quantities detained at the border and not being able to get them in the United States to force a company to say, okay, finally I'll figure out all the different sub-tiers that led to my, uh, you know, to my product. But yeah, look, the focus on forced labor was absolutely protectionist. Uh, for, you know, the, even in the late 1800s, the U.S. had in place bans on the imported goods that were produced with prison labor, and that was simply because U.S. companies did not want to be undercut by companies who were using for, uh, prison labor outside the United States to produce the goods to compete with theirs. Uh, and, and that was um, you know, instantiated in Tariff Act of 1930. It's called Section 307. 
And prior to the UFLPA, the Section 307 mechanism was being used in an increasing way against a number of different countries, not just focused on China, to look at that forced labor issue. But the UFLPA issue is really not just forced labor. It's really focused on a very specific set of uh, government of China programs uh, that the United States um, just finds contrary to international human rights and norms. And so while it's protectionist, uh, some people can make the arguments protectionist, it's really focused on encouraging the, the Chinese government to stop those programs in that particular region. Um, and I think just as a counterpoint to protectionism, I think it's pretty interesting to look at the, the uh, statistics, because at least as of, as of June, I'm sorry, as of, as of July this year, the majority of goods that were detained were actually not direct imports from China. They were actually coming from Malaysia and Vietnam. So if it was really targeted just at competition with China, then you would expect more goods to have been detained in China. But in fact, what they're doing is trying to reach any supply chain that reaches into that particular region. Now, I, I'm advising companies regularly on the FLPA issues. Uh, they understand the concept, but I can tell you the way it's being implemented is a whole different game. Uh, CDP is really learning. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, companies are, um, um, you know, guinea pigs really in an in experiment that the CDP is doing to kind of ramp up to be able to enforce this law right now. Uh, but um, you know, I think I think you have to take a look at the specific programs that the U.S. was actually targeting with this initiative before you actually call on the Texas. Michael, you had also mentioned supply chain due diligence now requiring kind of the, the labor standard compliance. What's your, do you have any comments on measures like the FLPA? Sure, I mean, first of all, no, nobody's going to argue against human rights, right? But um, I just note that there may be uh, an aspect of this, um, you know, the whole story, but there may be an aspect of this hegemonic edge um, that we need to keep in, in, in mind. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Vietnam, Cambodia, other countries, yeah, you know, probably lower hanging fruit initially um, in terms of enforcement, uh, also potential circumvention um, with, with product actually coming out of China. Um, but, you know, it's nobody's against human rights. And to be clear, in Korea, uh, for example, we have a, a long history of fighting for human rights. I mentioned our law firm is very progressive. That, that's, that's their thing um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, improving human rights in Korea. We have strict rules, however, Compliance has been like so. Whether it's uh, you know the supply chain due diligence or other uh, rules that are intended to to force you to provide evidence of compliance with global standards, um, I think that's a good thing. Um, we, we we talk a good talk uh, in terms of culture. We show some good conduct, but in terms of evidencing um, you know, compliance with with human rights and, and other uh, labor laws, uh, what it will require on the ground is first contracts with the entities in your supply chain, which surprisingly many companies do not have. And a lot of it's wink wink purchase order um, for you know ex employees who went up and set up you know, another company that ends up selling to their employer. A lot of arrangements. A lot of arrangements that are gray. Um, there's, it's, a, it's a battle to fight all the way through your supply chain to make that transparent. Um, so initially contracts, and then you need to build in rights for review, um, inspection, monitoring. And, and that system of contracts will then generate evidence that you can show um, in, you know, to, to the EU, to the US, and otherwise. So um, that process is going to improve uh, the working conditions all the way through. Um, you know, it, it's not only the case of the Uyghurs, right? It, it, it's on, uh, in Korea, if you go to outside the major cities, if you go to Kine, near Busan, there are lots of small and medium-sized businesses, small factories that are in the supply chain for global names. Um, those places that run hard, you know, in, in Korea, it's Pakistan doing that. That's our Korean way of doing business. That's how we got here, working hard. But working hard and pushing hard, those are labor violations, even under Korean law. Um, and so, you know, we need, we need to make adjustments, particularly in the last point that maybe relates to you guys a little bit, is uh, because of our, our low fertility rates. We have greater, greater uh, international labor uh, participation in Korea. They tend uh, a lot of them to work in these jobs um, that others that you know are not lining up for, um, and they're not lining up for them because the labor standards are you know they're hard. Um, so it, it, it's all interrelated. I think it's a good thing. Um, it's it's elegant like the CBA because it forces us to to do things that we believe in, but you know maybe next year. Um, but now we have to do it much sooner uh, if we want to sell. The choice is there, right? If you don't want to sell then you don't have to do it. But you know, we, if we want access to those markets, we, we will need to uh, 
uh, get up to go to the standards and uh, discipline. Super interesting career perspective and good plug for our two supporter of human rights. Great. <laughs> Eugene, do you have any comments? So I, mean, I, I think to the question of whether it's less controversial, whether this is protectionist or not, um, I don't, or I don't think that it's less controversial. I, I, about whether it's protectionist or not, I think this is also to Chris's point. I think it's just that there's broad agreement that this is something that is that that we should do. Um, you know, to, to Michael's point, that no one's going to argue against protection of human rights. Um, I think that there is a lot of concern, you know, that UFLK is being implemented in a manner that is overly broad or, or um, in a manner that has a protectionist effect that doesn't necessarily go to the human rights aspect of it. Again, I think that it goes to, kind of, from my perspective, just making sure that the measures are implemented in a way that it is intended to operate and not in an unintended or, you know, a, a periphery purpose of having having also a protectionist. Um, in fact, it can certainly be both, but, you know, it. it it should be a human rights issue. It should not be um, a protectionist issue, in my view. Um, but I mean, these have mostly been issues with implementation. Um, Michael, you you emphasize the importance of you know. Okay, so we we talk a good talk um, about you know, human rights, but you know now we're being forced to actually provide the evidence of that. I do agree that that's a good thing. I think that the concerns that a lot of companies have had is a very practical one. In that you know, how do we document this? What are the what is, the I think the CBP has to come up with a standard that's not impossible to meet. Um, and the, the the encouraging thing I think that from from a practitioner's perspective, you know, in dealing with CBP on these issues, you know, I I, I think that CBP is truly struggling with these issues about how to make it workable. I don't think that this is a situation where the government is stonewalling and saying, look, you know what, this is the rule, this is the rule. If you can't meet it, then then you know, go pound sand. I think that you know, in, in our interactions with CBP, we have seen CBP truly try to prove to see, well, you know, pushing a little bit. Well, is this really something you can provide, or is it not? Um, so I think that that's kind of the encouraging part of it. Um, I do think that this is a difficult topic because the UFLP by design isn't meant to make it easier. You know, it's, it's intended to make it difficult and it's not intended to, to really police the behaviors of, of, of the importers or the companies necessarily, but of the government, of the, of, of, you know, the Chinese government programs. And so it's intended to be difficult. So I think that that's kind of the difficult balance that the US government is facing and needs to face right now in terms of companies actually being able to do business um, but also maintaining that strong stance that, that they've rightfully taken on human rights violations. Great. So we covered a lot of ground. I think we have like one minute to wrap up. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I'm not going to go through this slide. Um, I think our panelists, we were also going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, because we talked a lot about kind of U.S. centric measures, U.S. the actions that the U.S. Are, US is taking. What about, you know, countries like Korea? What, what does Korea get to do? Uh, but maybe maybe you can skip that uh, for today in the interest of time and just go straight to to the wrap up. Um, next slide, please. So after all of that, we covered, like I said, a lot of ground, a lot of different topics. The question comes down to what is happening. What is happening to free trade? Where where do you see free trade going? And what I put up here is it's the preamble to the agreement that established the WTO. Um, and you know, as we've said, kind of the WTO is seen as the beacon of of free trade and trade liberalization, but it actually has a lot of the language that we are seeing these days um, that's being now intertwined into trade measures uh, more than before, but maybe it was always kind of part of the WTO system as, as, as Chris mentioned. So last last take, and for this one, whoever wants to go first, what do you see happening to free trade? Who wants to go? Like they want to face the nation or something in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would just say, um, uh, or views are, but um, look, I, I think for a number of different reasons, the trends are pretty clear here. The national security, supply chain resiliency, strategic and economic competition. I think there's more and more trends towards bilateral and plurilateral free trade agreements, uh, also towards nearshoring and friendshoring, uh, and particularly with respect to strategic goods and emerging technologies. And I think we saw uh, really significant evidence that this week when uh, the U.S. government granted uh, uh, validated end user licenses to major uh, semiconductor here in Korea uh, to enable them to continue to use uh, China's supply chain. But that's a perfect example of uh, friend shoring and ensuring that uh, your friends continue to have access uh, to the supply chain they need for, uh, you know, for their, their manufacturing activity. Mine's very short. The free trade is dead. <laughs> Long live free trade. Um, the tradition would settle in the king passes. 
it is you know, going to be a different environment. We need to adjust. Um, you know, the global economy will move forward um, under whatever regime. You know, it's the WTO that gets fixed and we can add or we just have to muddle through. Um, you know, I'm not a, a national spokesperson that was working with companies. We all muddle through. Um, but we need to be smart. Korea, we need to be more aggressive about it. And not just take these things as exogenous things that happen. We can adjust. There is lead time that we can get by, by working with experts. Um, and, and I think that's not uncommon for us to be much more uh, proactive about managing these the uncertainties. I, mean, I agree with fully with, with uh, both my colleagues. I mean, you know, like everything, free trade is changing. Um, it is not dead. Um, and, and I think that the trade landscape you know, is, is evolving, and I think that as, as the trade um, landscape evolves, I think that we're going to see more players. Because, I mean, it's been the United States, it's been the EU that's kind of led global trade, you know, at the WTO and elsewhere. But I think that, you know, like, we're seeing a diversification of the global economy right now, where we're seeing a lot more countries stepping up and taking the lead um, on various issues. And when we're seeing, you know, we're, uh, whether it's bilateral agreements or whether it's regional agreements or plurilateral agreements, whether it's RCEP, CPTPP, it's not necessarily the United States that's taking the lead in everything right now. So I think that we're going to see kind of more countries emerging as, you know, even if they're not economic superpowers, as playing a very important role in making sure that we are able to model through despite the various challenges that we're facing right now. I think for, for, for Korea, this provides an opportunity. Um, you know, it, it, there is a gap, there's a leadership gap right now, and a lot of countries are, you know, coming up to fill it, and I think that Korea is very well positioned. It is a very well-respected country. Uh, it has sophisticated systems. It has a lot of experts that know what they're doing. You have a great government and a lot of people that are very smart in government. And I think that you know this is an opportunity for Korea to step up and take a leadership role at the WTO and elsewhere. Great, great way to end the panel. So we are at time. If there are burning questions, we can take them or we can release you to network amongst yourselves. Um, if there isn't anything, can we go to the next slide? I did promise the ABA to promote a publication that is coming out, so please take a look at this title. If you want to order it, there is how you do that. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.